I'm Dr. Harold Hubaum, I'm Chair of the Centre for Energy and Climate Policy. I'm Sarah Gupta, I'm an analyst with the Adaptation and Resilience Department at the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change. Sarah, good to see you yeah. after about, what, how long has it been, a year? I think so, yeah. We're going to start this by me pulling out a question for you. Cool. And see how we go. All right. All right. Okay. How important is international cooperation in achieving a climate resilient and sustainable future that is also just and fair? Very important. The idea of not just providing aid in the sense of the global north providing aid, but reparations that are paid to the global south in order to get them to an even playing field um, in this new climate world is super important. And we're seeing that the global north has actually not really stood fast on their promises. Lots of countries have defaulted on their, you know, packages or, or promised financial goals, right? You know, a lot of these international agreements, the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, they're supposed to be achieved by 2030, they get a bad rep. When right. you, when, you know, because, well, we haven't achieved the climate goals. Right. We're already at 1.5 degrees, right? That was the ambition of the Paris Agreement. The goal is below, well below yeah. two degrees uh, above global average surface temperatures or increase uh, above pre-industrial levels. And the SDGs are far from being met. Being met. Yeah. Uh, so arguably, they're not really performing, right? If they're not performing, What's the point of having them? I feel like there's obviously some sort of positive impact that's coming mm. out of these global agreements, right? Even if they're not being met, there is an effort for them to be met. Mm -hmm. And just having that agenda, that having a goal set up does mobilize um, investments and conversations and projects in the right direction. How can politics contribute to the creation of a fairer and more sustainable world? Are we doing enough? I would make a distinction between politics and evidence-based policymaking. Yeah. Uh, evidence-based policymaking is what we would like to address the climate crisis. We could use uh, climate science and the data and information that we have um, and make decisions on the basis of that. That's not what really happens, as right. you well know, because all policymaking happens within a space that is political and often heavily politicized. Right? So instead of just being driven by the evidence on the climate emergency or on the things we ought to be doing to transition our economies, we're driven by special interests, right. we're driven by path dependencies, uh, we're driven by political ideology, by party platforms, by a lot of different things yeah. that run counter sometimes to those things we ought to be doing to address the climate crisis effectively. I think corruption for me is one of the biggest ones yeah. that comes across, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, like growing up in India, you see a lot of great policy documents come out. Um, you see a lot of good initiatives, but then, you know, like 10 years later, nothing's been done. Mm. Um, and I think that's changing. I think, uh, and I think maybe that's where like the private sector can come in. Um, they do drive, they have, advocacy groups, they have lobby interests, um, so they can drive a lot of this conversation. Sometimes they drive it for the worse, sometimes yeah, for sometimes the better, they can, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I guess like a more conducive, climate-friendly political, in, political environment. Yeah. The climate crisis presents enormous challenges, and it's often talked about in highly negative terms. Are there reasons to be optimistic and hopeful? We are divesting from fossil fuel industries. Um, you have all these new technologies and uh, innovations coming in that actually will create a more resilient future, right? So whether that's water resilience, that, whether that's crop resilience, whether that's infrastructure resilience, you have the methodology there. We have the know-how, we have the resources, we have the money. It's just, um, it's just a question of mobilizing it. Uh, which, of course, in itself is a really big challenge. And yeah, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think there are many reasons to be hopeful. I'm actually more optimistic today and have been for the last few years 
than I was 10, 15 years ago. Interesting. Um, because today the issue is on top of the agenda and nobody is removing it from that position anymore. But I think SOAS did like such an incredible job at definitely delivering this message of the urgency of climate change, but also delivering just tools and thinking hats and uh, tangible thought processes that we could use, that I use currently at work um, to actually grapple with these problems and come up with solutions that aren't, uh, that aren't impossible, that are very feasible, um, you know, small incremental changes lead to big things. And I think, um, yeah, doing the masters at SOAS was very helpful in uh, equipping me with some of these tools. I did not, I did not tell you to, to that say That is true. This. He did not tell me to say that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is true. I think I really enjoyed my, uh, the conversations I had at SOAS. Um, and in fact, I really enjoyed writing my dissertation, um, which I know I pestered you about like every week. Um, but yeah, I think it was, it was incredible. Uh, it was so fun. <laughs>